for being here at the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. Uh, this is an important day in the life of our college and what we believe to be an important moment of public health for the state and Commonwealth of Kentucky. I'm Kelly Smith and I'm proud to serve as Interim Dean of the College of Pharmacy. And I'm even more proud today to share with you some of the great work that our faculty members have done to address an important issue that's facing our communities across the Commonwealth. That is of opioid abuse, whether it be from pain pills that are misused, or from the growing scourge of the heroin epidemic, it's really affecting dramatically our communities and our families. So it's important that we take action. And fortunately today, we're gonna hear the tales of two of our, our very own, our faculty members who are natives of Kentucky, who are graduates of the University of Kentucky and are now serving Kentucky and the greater public health good by the work that they have done. I'm pleased to share with you the stories then today and, and to introduce them throughout this morning. You'll be hearing from Drs. Trish Freeman and Dr. Stan Warmeling. Uh, but first, we're going to hear from Dr. Eli Capaluto, the 12th president of the University of Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Capaluto uh, had a life before his role as president here at the university and, and recall that he was a public health dean. Uh, so clearly this is going to be an issue of one of passion and importance to him. So Dr. Capaluto, please come forward and share with us the broader story of our advances here. Uh, thank you, Dean Smith. I, I had a life before and, and I want to continue my life. Uh, and it's an, it's an honor to serve as president of the University of Kentucky. So today reflects a fundamental part of the promise and purpose of the University of Kentucky. And our efforts as researchers, creators of knowledge, to me, uh, centers around one common virtue, and it's hope. Because I'll guarantee you the stories you're gonna share today, these persistent researchers had failure after failure after failure before they had the breakthrough that we celebrate today. Emily Dickinson said that hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings tunes without words. So it's easy when you look at these devastating statistics in Kentucky, these horrific deaths, you sometimes think it is unalterable. How can we reverse this? And every day you seem to read or watch the media, and it can, you, can leave you with the impression that we are without hope. But I believe this work defines hope. I believe the University of Kentucky and the University for Kentucky gives hope flight. And it is our responsibility of this, as the state's flagship and land-grant university. It is a responsibility we hold most high. Because of the work of these outstanding investigators, we are able to solve things from the cellular to the community level. So we're going to have a breakthrough that involves, you know, a, a medical intervention, but more importantly, because of the training that we've developed here, led by our College of Pharmacy, pharmacists are going to be better able to treat their patients. So we've done it, cellular to the community level for the benefit of the Commonwealth and its citizens. Thank you all very much and congratulations. Well, it's evident the passion that Dr. Capilouto has for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, and we're also joined this morning by someone who's passionate about that, and that's our provost, uh, Dr. Tim Tracy. And we're glad that he's here to help celebrate the work of his colleagues uh, when he served as, as dean of the College of Pharmacy and continued colleagues now uh, with research and teaching and practice efforts throughout the Commonwealth. So Dean Tracy, or Dr. Tracy now, please thank you for joining us as well. 
So let's hear now directly from those who are, who are bringing these innovations to light. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our first uh, researcher that we are focusing today on, and that's Dr. Dan Wormeling. Dr. Wormeling is a professor here at the College of Pharmacy. Um, he is a proud graduate of the University of Kentucky, the College of Pharmacy, and even completed his postgraduate training here at the University of Kentucky and is more than 25 years serving as a researcher and clinician and really making breakthroughs throughout the profession. He has brought a great learned as a student and trainee. Uh, so Dr. Wormling, uh, please, please come share with us a bit of the with Nelakram article centered in Mount Sterling and Moorhead, Kentucky where two students who had entered into a voluntary rehabil rehabilitation program to detoxify were released from 30 days of treatment and then within a month of their release both passed away from an opioid overdose. And that was sort of my uh, motivation, if you will, started from that place and also some other confluent events. One is that my colleagues actually pointed me in a direction by handing me a public health paper that said, Save by the Nose, expanding access to the opioid antidote naloxone. And he handed me this paper, and he said, Dan, this is something I think you can do. Because the product that was being used at the time was either injection, which is not practical for lay use, uh, or they would take the injection and adapt it with a nasal sprayer and prescribe and release that product, but that's not designed for nasal delivery. But it does seem to work, and so our ambulances here, even in Fayette County, use this technique. So that was the motivation, was to begin this pathway of developing naloxone nasal spray. Now we've moved a lot farther along in the last six years and a new drug application is pending before the Food and Drug Administration and they're, they're supposed to make their decision the week of Thanksgiving. So we're hoping uh, in about six or eight weeks at least one of the two pending new drug applications for naloxone, either our product or the other one, but at least one of the new technologies will now be available for pharmacies to stock and for patients and families to have in their home. The other part that I like to talk about for this is to use the analogy of EpiPens. We think of EpiPens for peanut allergy and other uh, serious ailments where someone needs to be rescued quickly. And the challenge with EpiPen nationally is that it took 10 years for the medical legal system to change so that doctors could write prescriptions for EpiPens legally in their state. And so if you think about that amount of time, the public was probably underserved by the needs to have access to this life-saving medicine. You can think of naloxone nasal spray or access to other naloxone products in the same way. And so the leadership of Dr. Freeman, who will be introduced next, is the transition. Because now we have new technology probably on the cusp of approval from one or more companies to reach the marketplace. But now what we need is to fill the education gap. Practitioners and families need an understanding that this product is now available and can be used. But many physicians, if you ask them about access to naloxone, they would have not an understanding that this is something they could prescribe even today. It's unfamiliar to them. It's only familiar to ambulances, emergency rooms, and operative recovery rooms where the product is typically used. So we have a significant education gap for practitioners and for families. And it's, we're at that transition point now, and hopefully it won't take 10 years for us to adopt this new technology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wormling. So it's exciting to hear the work that's being done here, uh, right in Lexington, to take a new drug or a new technology for an existing, or what would we consider an old dog, new tricks, um, and working with the FDA to bring that to light, and, and to do so in a way that increases access. And that's the message that you're gonna now hear from Dr. Trish Freeman. Uh, Dr. Freeman is a two-time graduate of the College of Pharmacy, um, and is also the director of the Center for the Advancement of Pharmacy Practice here in the Commonwealth. So she'll now share with you that journey that many pharmacists are soon to be taking along that route. Dr. Freeman. 
Thank you and good morning. As someone who spent a lot of time here at the UK College of Pharmacy, first as a student and now as a faculty member, I really think this project is a, is a classic example of the land grant mission of the university. That mission calls on us to lead efforts in education, research and outreach and working with my colleague, Dr. Wormling, we are doing just that. As Dr. Wormling was completing his work on developing the new uh, delivery system for naloxone, Kentucky Pharmacy's organizations worked with our elected leaders in Frankfurt to help change public policy. Thanks to these efforts, pharmacists now acting under a physician-approved protocol can dispense naloxone without an individual physician's prescription. Pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare provider. They practice in 119 of 120 counties here in Kentucky. This new policy will have major impact on public health in Kentucky by allowing more individuals access to this life-saving drug right in their home communities. But in order to uh, ensure that this is truly a public health win for all of Kentucky, we had to ensure that Kentucky pharmacists were prepared to deliver these new services. To that end, the Advancing Pharmacy Practice Coalition, a partnership between the College's Center for the Advancement of Pharmacy Practice, as well as the major pharmacy organizations in the state, has launched a statewide tour to bring training opportunities to pharmacists across Kentucky. With our coalition partners, some of whom are in the room today, uh, Mr. Bob McFalls from the Kentucky Pharmacist Association. We are blanketing the state. We started at the KPHA meeting in Bowling Green in June, and recently we have presented the program at state association meetings and continuing education conferences in Louisville and in Lexington. Just this week, on Tuesday evening, we spent the night in uh, northern Kentucky in Dr. Wormling's hometown. Over the next several weeks, we'll be visiting communities in Owensboro, London, Corbin area, in Pikeville, and then we will also head back to Louisville and, and then train pharmacists right here in the College of Pharmacy um, that live in, in, and work in the Bluegrass region. Additionally, we will be training our pharmacy students and the students at Sullivan University College of Pharmacy, so they will be prepared to fulfill this new practice expectation upon graduation. As a pharmacist and native Kentuckian, this project to me is an important milestone in the practice of pharmacy. Like any field, the practice of ph pharmacy is continually changing and evolving. And that's the beauty of our College of Pharmacy. At our profession's every turn, at our every evolution, we strive to be front and center, assuming leadership roles that advance practice and improve the health of Kentuckians. Thank you. So that concludes our formal comments this morning. Uh, hopefully you've really gained a sense of the passion um, that, that we as Kentuckians have in this issue and bringing to light the spirit of innovation and really integrating what we learn every day in the classroom to bringing that to patient care. Uh, we now have the opportunity uh, for our speakers to entertain any questions from the media. So we have a question regarding who would actually be administering the naloxone product itself. So a person who overdoses is, uh, is unconscious. And so the person can't save themselves. So it's usually someone close to you, uh, a family member, a spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, something along those lines as to the person that's close to you. And that's the same thing with EpiPen is that it requires a third party, commonly unknown, you don't know who at the moment uh, may be called upon the point of this and is deprived of oxygen uh, for a period of time, your body doesn't tolerate that very well. Appear in the health system at all. Uh, and so it's substance abuse uh, facilities where people might show up 
and uh, be seen. So it can happen a lot of different ways. Uh, some think of it almost like uh, the AED programs, the defibrillators, where the medicine needs to be a wash all around so that there can be access when it's needed. Because you have to go hunting for it, you're losing time. So the product in Kentucky is not available um, over the counter. It's only available from a pharmacy who has a pharmacist who's been certified to initiate the dispensing of naloxone under a protocol. And once those pharmacists are um, certified, then they are able under that protocol to initiate the dispensing of naloxone to people that they proactively identify that may be at risk for unintentional overdose because of the combination of medications they take or the disease states they have. They also would have the authority, if their protocol allows, to administer a dispense, excuse me, to um, individuals who come in and voluntarily request, make a request for that naloxone because of concern they have for a loved one. So the, the risk factors for this for an overdose are, are fairly well known. And if you go on YouTube, you will see videos of mothers who learned about naloxone after the fact, after their child passed. And they weren't made aware or known of it prior to that. And so the anguish that you can hear in their voices is extreme. Um, and so in this case, what we need to do is educate families because it's usually not the person who has the problem that's going to come in. It's someone else that cares and loves them that is going to come in and say, I'm concerned this could happen in my home. And even if there's one person that's at risk, there's frequently more than one. And so you would want to have this in the house and that the family knows where it is and how to use it just as you would for EpiPen. The, the general concepts are no different. This training is just focused on the pharmacist and preparing the pharmacist so they can apply to the Board of Pharmacy for that special certification. And then once that's done, we're hopeful that pharmacists will um, have programs in their communities that will, will increase uh, the knowledge that the, the patients and the family members have about this medication and how to access the medication. It's important to note that the regulations that accompany the legislation that was passed in March do have required um, counseling elements that a pharmacist must provide to that third party uh, consumer who's coming to the, to the pharmacy before they dispense that product to the consumer. Another analogy I like to use is immunization of a community. And in this case, if you know that there's a community that has a lot of high risk circumstances around it, then you can do things proactively. Uh, and so for example, Cape Cod, so this, you know, Cape Cod, the uh, community there advertised through their public television and newspapers that they were going to have a training and naloxone dispensing program. And anybody could come. But you would spend 90 minutes there, and there were paramedics and doctors and uh, other people there to help train on overdose recognition. What does it look like? What do you do? And the steps that were just mentioned are outlined. And then they would actually fill out just the minimal paperwork so that every person who came, and there were 50 people who came to the meeting, that every person who came to such a meeting left with naloxone. I think about that as vaccination. You just vaccinated a community by having 50 released all at once. That's hugely efficient. And you're getting the community much more engaged themselves by doing it through public forum, like on Channel 3, you know, on our televisions that we see every day. So the 
the dosage forms that could be administered would be outlined in the protocol in which the pharmacists enter into with the uh, authorizing physician. There are currently three basic ways that are considered the standard of care for administering naloxone uh, via the third party. The first is um, via intramuscular injection, and there's uh, actually um, state, other states that have done this where you train the individual to draw up a dose of naloxone from a vial and administer it intramuscularly. There's also a product that's available, uh, an auto injector for intramuscular use, and then finally, um, we, we will have pharmacists who will have um, administer via the nasal spray using the syringes that are available for injection and attaching the atomizer device that converts that from an injection to a nasal administered product. So all three of those, if they're authorized in the protocol, would be allowed for the pharmacist to initiate the dispensing of. So, yes, so if you look up on your internet, uh, Imitrex nasal spray by GlaxoSmithKline, it's the same nasal spray uh, device, if you will, with a um, design formula to fit into that device. And so it's combining the two is what then creates the product that FDA would approve. And so it's unit dose, disposable, ready to use. It's fairly intuitive in terms of how to use it. Well, once again, we thank you for joining us today. Our speakers are also available for one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, we wish you the very best and look forward to the impact this will have on our communities across the Commonwealth. Thank you.